Good morning. Welcome, everyone. I think this is the first panel at Davos, so welcome to 2014 World Economic Forum. Um, we have a great panel today on the new digital context. Uh, you know, technology remains a very mysterious force <coughs> in the economy. Uh, you all know the story, but in 1992, Bill Clinton called all the, the top economists, academics, and business people to the White House to talk about the future economy. And in that three-day meeting at the White House, the word internet was never mentioned. In 2001, everyone said Silicon Valley was a backwater. The companies like Apple were has-beens. So it's a very difficult to predict marketplace uh, technology and digital in general. So it's hard to see the future of digital, but we're gonna try and do that this morning. Um, I, have, I am George Colony. I'm the CEO of Forrester Research based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We have a terrific panel with us today. To my left is Randall Stevenson, the chairman and CEO of AT&T, the US carrier. Next to Randall is John Chambers, uh, chairman and CEO of Cisco, uh, the US network equipment vendor. Marissa Meyer, chairman and CEO of Yahoo.com, one of the original web media sites. Uh, Mark Benioff, chairman and CEO of Salesforce.com, the US-based software company. And then finally, number five uh, on my list, Gavin uh, Patterson. Thank you for being here, the, the only non-US uh, person on our panel, CEO of British Telecom, the UK carrier. So before we uh, get started, is there, are there microphones in the room? Or actually, the, the room is small enough so we can hear you. Um, I want to ask the audience, just to, for a few notes, what do you want to learn this morning? A couple of ideas out there. What do you want to learn this morning? There's a microphone here. Is there just one mic in the room? Yeah, Jeff. Okay. Impact of what? Snowden. So NSA, et cetera. Yep, got, got it. Other ones? What people want to know this morning? Yeah. Okay. What is, what is a connected device? What do you mean by that? Okay. Are you happy, John? I asked that question. I gave him $20 already. Okay, exactly right. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay, good. Yes. Okay. I don't promise we're going to get to all these. We'll take one more. Yeah. How governments will be managing the internet. Okay. Good. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for the for the ideas. Um, let's start off on a personal note, um, and I want all of you guys to answer this question: What technology do you personally use that has in some way changed your life, and it cannot be a technology that you guys make? <laughs> no advertising. Oh, God. Well, I'll, I'll think about it for a start. So, uh, I don't know, would Randall, do you want to start? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't ready for that question. You said we don't, carry carry we don't uh, make I'll give you, I'll give you a story. we don't provide either. I mean, it's kind of limiting. All right, so let universe. me start. Okay, good uh, job. Thank you. <laughs> Jane, I love BlackBerry, but I switched over to the iPhone because of the apps. I use it tremendously. A lot of video capability, but never to miss an opportunity. It's going to be a video world. Two-thirds of the applications on the mobile phones will be video. We'll talk largely virtually for the future. I believe in the CEOs leading the way. So how does video change? Video is a changer for you. Per, I'm talking about you personally, John. Well, personally, it's, it's how I, I do my business. I do more meetings with my customers virtually than I do physically. And yeah. it allows me to watch everything from my grandchild, what she did yesterday, or what my grandson did yesterday, to business and interpret how good a sales forecast is. Does a person really believe the sales forecast or they hesitant on it? Yeah. So I think video is the primary way that you learn. Okay, good one. So he uh, cheated. It's something he makes, right? <laughs> well, I, I didn't do it. He, st right he started off with the iPhone. <laughs> started off with the, that's how he pretended he didn't make it. So, okay. Other ones. Mark. I, I'll, do, oh, Mar oh, oh, what? I'll let Marissa go. Oh, I was just going to jump in with definitely the, the iPhone. Uh, and I think that you know, the recent statistic is that the average person checks their smartphone 150 times a day, and I think I'm probably on the high end of that. And so I think that mobile is, is definitely one of the trends that is setting the pace for our business, but for almost everyone. Good, okay. I, I think that uh, the, the most important piece of technology that uh, changed my life this year is this uh, 
band I'm wearing on my uh, wrist, which is called Fitbit. And uh, how much have you lost? Hey, what's that? How much have you lost? Uh, I've lost 30 pounds wearing Yay. it. Yay! And I do about uh, 10,000 steps a day with it. But I have a really good story, actually, George. I want to tell you that. Um, you know, uh, it's communicating constantly with my phone, and it uses something called Bluetooth 4, which uh, kind of is updated. And then in my phone, it's got all the, uh, you know, all my analytics and dashboards, and, and then I'm, my scale is connected onto here, too. But the cool thing is, is this story, and this is going to, I think, help to kind of open your discussion a little bit, is last week I got a phone call from someone who probably should be on this panel but isn't, but here at the conference, Michael Dell. And I, you know, I just got my cell phone number. He's a customer. Hey, hey, what's happening? Is there a problem? No, no. Uh, Mark, are you feeling okay? Are you feeling okay, Mark? Uh, I'm like, what? What do you mean, Michael? Well, I'm very worried about you. I'm like, you are? Yeah, because I'm your friend on the Fitbit network, and I noticed in the last three days, uh, you haven't worked out. And <laughs> no, this is this is a true story. And, oh, you know, because we're competing, who can have the most steps every day? And he's, like, just completely blowing by me. And then all of a sudden he had a realization, wait a minute, something's not right. Was Mark okay? And I said, well, actually, Michael, I have a cold. Everyone in San Francisco had a cold last week. And I decided not to work out for three days, so I'm ready for Davos. But that was very interesting to me because suddenly it occurred to me that here I am. I'm, I'm living in the Internet of Things. I'm on the board of Cisco. We call it the Internet of Everything. I'm connected, you know, super connected. I've opted in my friends, um, probably ready to opt in my insurance provider if they will lower my rates based on my <laughs> right. fit, fit activity levels. And, um, but then I noticed that, well, what does it mean that, you know, here I am, I'm a, I'm a public company CEO, that somebody realizes that my, I have a cold or I have a problem or I'm not in the office for three days or that I'm not working out, that you actually know where I am soon, what my heart rate is, what my blood pressure is, what my glucose level is. Does this make You're you going to know. Does this make you feel good or bad? Well, I'm just putting it this. out there as a question for you, okay. which is, it's really interesting. I mean, I think for me, the personal enlightenment that you get through new technology today is so awesome that, you know, I know more about myself than ever, and others are starting to know more about me too, but what does it mean when everybody knows everything? And what is that going to do? And that really was yet last week. And so when I got that call, that really changed my view because, you know, behind every one of these devices and behind every one of these tweets and everything we forget or every device, you know, is a person. And, you know, in business we, we know that because they're our customers. So we always remember it's our customer. But it, it's going to fundamentally change um, our relationship with people, with others, with organizations. And that is this kind of huge breakthrough that's Really going, how many people here wear a fitness band, actually? A Fitbit or a Nike Fuel band? Yeah. I mean, look, that's about a third, I would say, to the half of the audience. And we don't really think about it yet, but we're going to be thinking a lot about it. And it's an exciting time. There's never been a more exciting time, as evidence of this panel is usually the Nobel laureates at the World Economic Forum doing the economic review. And we took their spot this year because... <laughs> we're smarter. Damn right. <laughs> because technology is really important, and there's never been a more exciting, more fun, more energetic time in our industry. But we don't know if this is good or bad. We may loop back to this. Well, but, that, absolutely. But we're going to leave this with other technologies people are using personally. I, They're changing your lives. I'll just, sure. uh, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I was last year in 2009. <clears throat> this always conflicts with my board meeting. And so I'm just sitting here watching this versus 2009. And all of these iPads up, videoing and taking pictures and smartphones, that did not exist in just 2000. Yep. They weren't here in 2009, by and large. And uh, last night, John and I have been comparing stories. We're both grandfathers now, and we're really gross about this. We compare grandkid stories. And last night, my grandson is sick, and I have my iPad up, and I'm conversing. He's one years old. We're not conversing, but he kissed... <laughs> He kissed my wife's <laughs> iPad, right? And you just think, to Mark's point, it just it personalized, the technology is personalizing things like we've not experienced before. And a video, you said it, video is changing how you think about business, but also how you think about at a personal level how you interact with family and so forth. And so mobile video, I think, is just really a huge change in terms of how we all behave and interact. Yeah, for sure, we call this the mobile mind shift. The, yeah. the consumers are, are, are shifting over to be dependent all, at all times on mobile. 
let's widen this out now. We've talked about personal technology. Let's talk, uh, in, in your laboratories or in your travels, you guys see a lot of technologies. Um, what are you exposed to which you think is going to be very critical in the future that m many people in this audience may not even know about? Not personal, but could be, could be corporate. Gavin, go ahead. Well, I, I think it's the, for us, it's the explosion of, of bandwidth and uh, the capability that's going to provide consumers and businesses. Uh, a few years ago, um, certainly even in, in, in BT, people didn't expect to need more than uh, 8 meg. Uh, and these days, uh, the ambition, the appetite of customers to, to use a lot more bandwidth and use it throughout the day, 24-7, is just exploding. Uh, and so every time you, you feel as though you've reached a, a cap on what people want to, to buy, um, it's clear that that's, uh, it doesn't last for long. So uh, certainly in our labs, seeing how far the technology can go, how fast uh, you can get um, speeds across the internet, uh, has been extremely exciting. We've been, we've been testing something called GFAST uh, that allows you to get uh, over, uh, over a gig into, into a premise. And I think you know, a few years ago, nobody would have thought that would have been possible um, and even there'd be any appetite for it but it's it's certainly the case it is possible now and uh, I think there will be demand so you gotta be careful are you promising mm -hmm. a lot more bandwidth to come quickly uh, I'm promising a lot more bandwidth That's a lot of capital <laughs> <laughs> and it's there if people want to pay for it but uh, I think this it's you know the so desire that. and the appetite for and, and the ideas uh, and how people use it, it we're just okay. at the beginning but we, we know we all have an appetite for much higher bandwidth but when are we going to get it maybe talk to you know, Randall can comment on this as well. It, when? It's, it's, it's growing at an unbelievable pace. The investment right. you're doing in the UK, the investment we're doing in the United States. I mean, examples start on the fixed line side. In Austin, we are putting fiber throughout the city of Austin, one gig to the, to the home in Austin. That's on the fixed line side. We're putting fiber to a million new business locations in the United States over the next three years. We did 220,000 of them this year. But then go to the mobility side, LTE deployment in the U.S. is at a hyper pace. Verizon's at 300 million pops pass. We're closing in on 300 million pops pass. The other two carriers are doing the same thing. You're seeing LTE. I mean, you have LTE here now, right? So bandwidth is exploding. And uh, John in, in, is involved in this also that probably the biggest fiber deployment initiative on the globe is fiber to all these cell sites. You're involved in fiber to yeah. cell sites. And so there's just this massive, literally multi-billion dollar investment going on around the globe to deliver this bandwidth. And it's, and it's impressive what it's doing because we all you know, have kind of lived over the last five or six years with this smartphone era maturing. And, and everybody's saying, well, what's next? Everybody's got a smartphone. And, and Mark was talking this a moment ago, and that is the smartphone has become the remote control for everybody's life. It's dictating and driving virtually everything we do behaviorally in our, in our work life and in our home life. It's driving the automation of the home. It's driving the automation of how I interact with my, my uh, customer information systems and so forth. It's, it's, it's actually Amen. the connected car, <laughs> right? The connected car is coming at hyperspeed. We've got deals done with General Motors and Tesla and Ford where the car is all connected to this, this wireless bandwidth around the globe. And so this is just really an exciting so time. So let, let, me, let me dumb this way down for us, this discussion of bandwidth. Uh, when will our cell phones run at twice the speed that they run today? What's yours running today here? L 8 meg. Well, let, in, let's in, just, in, just imagine LTE, right? We're so 8 meg is what I tested last night in my hotel room on the, the Swisscom LTE network. In the U.S., we're getting 15. Right, okay. Okay, so, and it's, it's getting better, all right? And that will just do well, nothing. When, when does it double? Well, I just, in the U.S., it's double what it is here now. I think Europe is going to see it doubling literally in the next 12 to 18 months. I'll be surprised and disappointed if it doesn't. So 2x two, uh, two in 18 months here. I agree here. with that, yeah. You agree with that? Yeah. But, John, from but the bandwidth is important. All that does is the connectivity. You watch the key trend we're all seeing. 10 billion devices connected to the Internet. 1984, 1,000. Those devices will move to all video. Out of those 10 billion devices, there'll be 77 billion application downloads this next year. You play this out three to five years, you'll see us making routers that can download the entire Netflix library in one second. Bandwidth will not be a problem. It's how do we apply it? And that really leads to this gentleman's yes, question over here. 
you're, uh, the biggest transition that's about to occur ever in IT is when you connect everything in this world, and I mean anything and everything. It will drive productivity of countries, it will change business models, it will change our everyday lives, and the number we put on that is 19 trillion in economic value over the next 10 years. That will make the progress we did on the internet since its inception dwarfed. It will be five to 10 times more the impact on society. So all of these come together to really enable that, and that's, that's candidly what I get excited so, about. So just to clarify here, so uh, Gavin and Randall are saying bandwidth is the big technology you see out there. John, you're saying it's the Internet of Things. No, you need all these together. Yeah. You've got to have well, applications with bandwidth, time. fixed and mobiles, with processors, cloud. with cloud, with security, with collaboration. And only when you bring them together do you begin to get the environment that really drives business and really gets the consumer so, excited. So just to make this real fair in the room, Internet of Things means that in this room in five years, there will be between, you, you give me your number, 50 to 100 internet, internet connected devices in this room, not on our bodies, but in these lights, it's sensors, et cetera, et cetera. That's what you're talking about. I think it'll be many, many Minimum times over. over. In, <laughs> this, in, in, this, tri- in this room. Oh, a trillion yeah. in connected sensors. sensors. And on your body, is going to be four trillion, or five. One trillion connected sensors, all on this new bandwidth. That, that's the amazing thing. Mark Andreessen has this great thing. He says, uh, these new sensors are the peace dividend of the cell phone wars. Because of all the innovation, because of all the change, all the investment that they're talking about, the stuff that's dropping out, the technology that's coming out at these remarkably low costs, it is amazing. And another one that, you know, that Randall really mentioned is the cell phone. <coughs> I have, how many, everyone here, raise your hand if you have your smartphone with you in the room. Every hand is going to go yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. But there's one and a half billion of these smartphones uh, in the world today. But there's five billion cell phones. And over the next 48 months, that'll be five billion of these smartphones. And that is a game changer on education, communication, commerce, productivity, Everything, all these cool apps that everyone in the world that starts to get them, that it's a, tr- you know, you, you, that it's broad based, that is amazing. And that these apps provide this much more direct relationship with um, your, as I said, your friend, your customer, your vendor. Uh, one of the cool uh, customers that we have is a company in the Netherlands called Philips. And they make a, they have a, this toothbrush that I, by at Costco called uh, Sonicare. I have you ever seen this? You use it, Randall? I do. Yeah, Randall and I have a lot in common. <laughs> anyway, not the new... I'm not going to go there. But yeah, <laughs> but the new, the new, the new Sonicare is Wi-Fi based and GPS located, okay? And it's kind of keeping true. track of where I am and how I'm brushing my teeth. And what's the first thing the dentist always asks us when we're coming to see him or her in the office? Have you brushed, right? Uh, do you know what I mean? Did you go to the dentist? Oh, have you brushed? Mark, have you been brushing? Oh, yeah, I've been brushing. Have you been flossing? Oh, yeah. And now the dentist say, what's your Philips login ID? <laughs> because I need to friend you on the Philips network because I want to see. He's not going to ask me if I brushed. The dentist is going to see. Oh, you haven't been holding it right. You need to hold it more like this. Look at this. These are your brushing patterns. And Mark, why did you not brush, you know, two days last week? It's Welcome to the Mark Benioff Health and, <laughs> and well, Hygiene panel. You want examples yeah. of don't things that are, I mean, I'm trying about. to give you an example, George, okay. but yeah. I don't want to interrupt you, but what I want to say is, well, I, want to <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to interrupt you, George, but what I would say is that on that toothbrush is also a help button, and you can have a help button, and then up on my smartphone comes somebody from Philips, you know, I'm having a problem with my toothbrush, with my oral health with my, you know, this, or I need a new dentist, and you know what, they're connected to me in an incredible new way, and that's amazing, and that's kind of, you know, it opens the door on all the trust issues. But and you I know, I'm going to take the conversation a little bit different way. If you watch the impact, <laughs> George, you're, you're going to love this panel. <laughs> Just if you're glad you never get in. We're, we're talking about transactions. This is how it changes everybody's life in this room. I had the chance to meet with President Park last night from uh, Korea. She's an engineer by background, but she understood immediately what connectivity meant to the future of our country, job creation, the ability to do a new generation of entrepreneurs, the ability to suddenly change their competitiveness on a global basis, bring health care and education. If you talk to the leaders in Israel, I think both Shimon Perez and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu are here, they get how that changes their country forever. 
If you talk to the key businesses, they know this is going to change their top line and bottom line in the way it has not occurred before. And to the point that all of us are making on this panel, it will change our health care in a better way. It will change our lives. It will be really fun. Now, Marissa, I'm going to give you the ball because if you okay, wait for okay, it, so, it okay, so okay, Go, Marissa. Okay, 20, 2014, I think, is really interesting because it is a tipping point. When you look at mobile, okay. when you look at the bandwidth, when you look at the Internet of Things, it's going to change everyone's daily routines really fundamentally. And I think that really comes down to the apps because it's not just how you connect, how it inspires you, how it entertains you, but there's really fundamental things happening. Uh, for example, on a recent Friday night, 150,000 people let strangers stay in their homes through Airbnb and the sharing economy. They're teenagers, is that? <laughs> some, some of them. Um, uh, more than 1.5 million people have hired strangers to do daily errands for them on TaskRabbit. 56% mm -hmm. of people would consider renting out their car to a stranger because when you've got the Internet of Things and you know where your car is or you know exactly what's happening in your home and you can verify who the person is who's going to be renting it and sharing it with you, you know, it makes connecting and trusting those people that much easier and it's going to change everything really very fundamentally. What do you, what do you call that change? Uh, well, I think that part of that is the sharing economy, but part of it is just this tipping point that's being reached by mobile, by the Internet of Things, by the bandwidth available, and the fact that it can just allow us all to connect and inspire and entertain each other in a way that, that has never happened before. 2014 okay. will be the tipping point. What Marissa said, you'll look back five years from now. This will be the year when you see it tip up. Okay, let, let's change the topic. Uh, last night, I was at the Tech Pioneers Dinner, which was fantastic. Um, this is the... the uh, the startups that, that come to Davos, there were about 25 terrific companies there. Um, disruption is our, everyone's favorite word, uh, usually coupled with the other word, digital. Why is it so hard for large companies? Uh, back up here a little bit. I don't think any of you can be accused of, being a dis of running disruptive companies. Maybe Mark is an exception here. Thank you, George, for that. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it so hard for, co for large companies to be <laughs> Why is it so hard for large companies to be disruptive? That's a fascinating observation. I, I probably would suggest that it may be as inaccurate as anything I've heard since I've been here, and I've not only been here a short time. But I, I uh, why I, I started with AT and T, Southwestern Bell, you know, back in the mid '80s, and it's interesting. That seems like a long time ago, but in the mid '80s. We had zero cell phone customers. We had zero broadband customers. It was technologies that didn't even exist at that time. And between cell phone um, or mobile telephony, broadband, and now cloud, it makes up 80% of our $127 billion revenue stream. And so these are industries, everyone, and by the way, you know, I don't get there without you. I don't get there on broadband without you, and you're the same way. And, and in the cloud, you know, you are going to be the main driver of the cloud. And companies that aren't moving and driving the new technologies are companies that don't stay alive. And, and so uh, it's, you know, maybe we're not disruptive to, um, you know, other industries or whatnot, but in terms of being disruptive in terms of what is facilitated, you think about what Marissa just went through and how the world is changing. What you talked about was we're driving inefficiencies out of every single facet of life, all right? Meaning, if you have spare capacity in your home, that inefficiency is being driven out by virtue of the mobile internet. If you have inefficiency in your automobile uh, utilization, that is being driven out by all of this. So all of this bandwidth, all these capabilities, connected devices are as disruptive as anything I think that we as a society have seen. And so I think anybody that's sitting on this stage has obviously thrived in that and has been somewhat disruptive. I, I, mean, I think it's, uh, Randall, Randall, you're saying that you feel ATT is a disruptive company and that you lead it to be disruptive. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, you know, I, I go back to... But, but T-Mobile feels like the disruptive force in your business, right? At least in the yeah, U.S. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, look, it's just a hyper-competitive industry. You know, I go back to... Two, I'll say what I said a moment ago. 2007, not five, six years ago, none of you had a smartphone. None of you owned a smartphone. The tablet didn't exist. There was no such thing as a mobile application. And somebody had to step out and build mobile internet capability. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to step out and change their business model to do an iPhone into the United States first. Those are all very disruptive things, and they changed industries and facilitated a lot of what you've seen here. And I, every one of us up here have gone through these kind of things. All right, I'm not saying AT&T is unique, but if, you don't, if you're not disruptive, you don't live. 
so my question is, why are big companies not disruptive? Do you all feel like you were... I'm going to be keep going very this. direct. If you, if you look at big companies, only a third of us will exist in a meaningful way in two decades. Uh, my industry, my competitors from 15 to 20 years ago, none of them exist or they've exited. From 10 to 15 years ago, only one exists. From 5 to 10 years ago, only a few. Randall, what he's done in his industry is disrupted again and again and again. As a company, we weren't even a player in the data center. Now you could argue we're the number one cloud player, infrastructure and data center wise. How, if you how, don't disrupt, you get left behind. How do you lead disruption? How do you lead your company to be disruptive? You catch market transitions, you listen to customers, and then something I believe in, you tie these together in a way that gives you architectural advantages to move fast. But you have to build that into your DNA. You have to tell your teams you want to take risk, and by definition, you're occasionally going to fail. And you've got to create that culture to do it. But I would argue these companies up here across the board, I will bet you all five of us will be major players 10 years from now, and I bet you two-thirds of our peers won't be there. There's, there's no I, way of uh, business. Sorry, Mercy. Oh, I was just going to say it's either change or be changed. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I think for us, you know, we have really sophisticated models that look at what's going to happen with our traffic this year. And for Yahoo, 2014 is the year of crossover. By the end of this year, we will have more mobile users and more mobile traffic than we have PC traffic. And so you, know, you have to be prepared for that. And we pride ourselves on running the world's largest startup. You know, can you actually be a big company and be flat, be transparent, give lots of autonomy, and really enable people to think about how should we be changing and what are the new disruptive things so we should be getting into? How have you led the Yahoo to be, to, I would agree, it's been a much more disruptive force in the last 12 months since you've, or since you've been there, Marissa. How have you led it to, to, to be disruptive? Well, I think a lot of it comes with the people. So it's a matter of hiring the right people and making sure that those people are really informed. So you know, we try and run things really flat, very transparent. We do you know, things that are considered kind of crazy, like the, the company actually writes the board slides, they see the board slides, they are participating really actively in all the different decisions that we're making and all the observations from your toothbrush to the Fitbit to Airbnb, they're seeing all that and they're bringing their best ideas forward and saying, this is the next application that we should build. So when you arrived at Yahoo, you felt the well, I'm not going to speak to the entire workforce, but many were not were not did not have disrupt, disruptive DNA. Well, I think you had to what, bring that. I mean, it, every company is unique. What happened there is that there was you know five years of turbulence leading up to it. And when I got there, I was really blessed because there were fantastic people with amazing ideas that had all this pent up energy, and they were like, okay, you know, can we go now? Right? Like, and we yeah. want to run. Like, we actually really want to make something happen, and we've been waiting for that moment. And you know, I really think that. You know, the best thing you can do as an executive is play defense, not offense. Get everybody out of the way and set up an environment where they can really run and ultimately make it. So difference. you basically so you, harnessing that energy was so the you most unleashed thing. disruption. Yeah. Well, was, I mean, I think they did, but I tried to enable it, and right. <laughs> harness it a bit. I actually <laughs> think that uh, you know the, your premise is not as true as it used to be, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you why. Because everything is going so much faster that companies have to change faster. I was just outside with. Um, before I walked in here, I was walking in, I was talking to um, the C CEO of a large uh, unit of General Electric. I look at what General Electric is doing, which is one of the largest companies in the world, and it's a broad, a fundamental disruption of their business and their technology model. They listen to all of us, and they say, well, we make aircraft engines and locomotives, and we make turbines and CT scanners, and what they've done is they've said, all of these things, they call them machines. All of the machines that we make, they make machines that matter, they call it, will have APIs, and we'll provide analytics out of every machine. And all of these things will have predictive capabilities. All of them will be collaborative so that engineers that run these machines can share between our engineers and the customer's engineers. And every machine will have a help button on it so that immediately I can get connected back to the customer can talk to us all in real time. And then they said, and the customer is never going to buy a machine from us again. Instead, we're going to go to the model that the cloud providers are providing, which is pay-as-you-go service. And we're going to be a huge service company, and we're going to provide all of our machines pay-as-you-go, coupled with all the professional services and collaboration services and analytic services and everything you need to run the machines and make them successful. Now, that, in my view, is not just a new technology model, but a new business model. And when you look at what Jeff is doing versus what Jack had before, there's no comparison. And it's a broad adaption of the network. At, at this point, you can look, go industry by industry, and I can probably give you examples of the largest company in each and every industry completely transforming themselves 
because the technology that we have been given over the last decade is so unbelievable that the, the transformation, the ability to transform today is just much easier. You can make this change, you can make this shift, and you can do it right now. And you can see that it's a new world driven by the cloud, by social, by mobile, and by all these connected things and these sensors, and you can bring that in. It doesn't matter if you're a car company or if you're an industrial manufacturer or a healthcare provider or whatever, A, B, C, D, E, F, every company is changing and transforming, and I don't think your premise of your question <coughs> is true anymore. I think it might have been true a decade ago because the technology, there, the speed of change was not high enough so companies didn't have to react to their customers. But today, if you're not listening to your customers more deeply than ever before and reacting to them more rapidly than ever before, then you are probably making a mistake. You've got to really start adapting. And I have found that companies are doing this and that's also why you see I think actually relatively good performance by very large companies right now. You know, you look at some of these large companies, they're doing what, I think there's gonna be, act, you know, I'm a huge bull, but I really think that we're gonna see huge growth over the next decade that's driven by all of these things. Not only is the US gonna have a great year this year, and I think Japan is gonna have a great year, and China's gonna have a great year, but I think the world is gonna have a great year, and a lot of it is enabled by, because we have this, banking crisis behind us and the, the economists are not on this stage anymore. And this is about new ideas. You yeah. know, you might just call this session, it's not about the new digital context, it's the new ideas context. So, so to interpret, Mark, if, if I were to tell you, in the future, every company will be a software company. And to, and to, to live in the market, be not heavy, so, I don't be know about equipment. software, George. I don't know if you know my thought on that. But I think well, it's, you know, I, when we talk about software traditionally, you know, you that word kind of, brings forth complexity and risk up front and cost, but I think every company is gonna look a lot more like BT and AT&T, actually. You know, they're gonna be service providers, they're gonna be rateable companies, they're gonna be customer, they're gonna be companies who are driven by the customer because the customer is gonna have choice. Randall's talks, he said, well, it's hyper-competitive, it's just a customer-driven industry, that's all it is to it, and he has to deliver to the customer every day all of us are gonna to have to deliver to our customers, and I'll tell you why that is. Because of one basic, simple point, and that is, we're connected to them yeah. constantly. So, so, so the so customer's like, what? The, I can't talk to them right now? Well, who else can provide this thing to me? <laughs> oh, we'll switch over, download, boom. Oh, and now I'm using that company. Yeah. And that's pretty cool. But it cool. takes software to be able to do that. And, and well, I, software I, I, in terms it of programming. In, in a big code. term, yeah. okay. Yeah. Gavin, but you've been waiting, Gavin, to go. Yeah, no, I, I would just echo what's been said so far. I, I challenge the premise. Um, any big company that isn't innovating, isn't disrupting their business model, isn't challenging the, the, uh, the status quo, will it's not dead. survive. There's no question about that. And, and we've, as a company, managed to survive since 1869 uh, by continuing to, to, to change and, and innovate so, along the so way. So what's the one way that you lead BT to be well, disruptive? I, I think the key is you've got to invest in R&D, but you've got to be clear where your competitive advantage lies. And then outside of that, you've got to be open and you've got to look to partner with, with, with companies and, and not look to try and do it all yourself. Uh, so we keep a, a team um, who scour the world. They're based in Silicon Valley, but they look all around the world for the latest trends, the latest ideas, the companies that are, uh, are looking at things from a different perspective and, and try to work with them, sometimes partnering, sometimes buying a stake, uh, an investment in them, uh, sometimes finding a way of going to market uh, to involve them in our business model. And, and I think that's the key. It's knowing where you've got a competitive advantage, but being open to, to being able to collaborate uh, to ensure that you know where you can get uh, the best from the, from the market. You're being modest about what these guys have done at BT because here was a, a big iron fixed line company that had no mobility business and these guys just went and changed their model, made a huge commitment to invest in fiber. They also said, no, we have no mobility business, went and bought some Spectrum. You've been doing a really impressive job of Wi-Fi enabling a lot of buildings and capabilities around uh, the you, UK. Randall. And they, they, they're becoming a bit of a mobility company. And then they go out and do something that few other, what I call true kind of broadband companies around the globe have done. They had the courage to go do content deals. 
Yeah. And you have disrupted the model yeah. in the UK by doing some very unique and disruptive yep. things. And I think it's, it's a, I, I commend what PT has done. It's been impressive and fun to watch. Uh, we will get to the audience questions in a moment, but I want to get into this question that, that Jeff Jarvis asked. Um, so Obama, uh, President Obama uh, last week came out and he said that the NSA will, there will be more restrictions on the NSA, but he, he said nothing about how uh, tech vendors would be protected from the NSA. I may not be using the right terms here. If Obama was sitting right in front of us, what one request would you make of him? President Obama, if he was sitting right here, and in your case, Gavin, you can say Prime Minister Cameron. What, were, one, what one request would you make to President Obama or Cameron? Transparency. Yeah. Uh, the ability to, one, understand, so we can help our users understand exactly how many requests we're getting, um, and or at least the range of types of requests we're getting, and how that data is going to be used, because we need to be able to rebuild trust with our users. Do you feel the trust has been, has fallen because of this, Marissa? Um, uh, yeah, I, I definitely think so. I think that, and not only within the U.S., but also internationally, certainly there are other countries um, that, that really have concerns about what the NSA is looking at. And, and I think that transparency is something that would really ultimately help this. So when you say transparency, do you mean that you want Yahoo to be able to divulge to the public exactly what the requests are? Or do you want the NSA to, to divulge before they make them to you? Well, we already have something called a transparency report where, for example, for local government requests, we can, we can divulge how many we get and, how, and ultimately the nature of those requests, how many are criminal, et cetera. Uh, and we really want to be able to do the same thing on the NSA level. And today, we're prohibited from doing that. Okay. We're, we're affected in a different way. Um, we are not a service provider or a content owner, so we don't get any government orders. We don't share our code with anyone uh, in the world. And so we, we come at it from a different perspective. We need some rules of the road that everybody can live with, especially among countries that are very closely allied. And it's been the wild, wild west around the world, and we need all countries to come up with, here are some general guidelines that we're going to do, starting with transparency uh, within that arena. So your request to, to President Obama would be that you want to know what the guidelines for Cisco in dealing with other countries? No. Well, the cow countries will work together to solve this issue because it's a connector world on a global basis. I don't have the same issues my colleagues do who are service providers or in the content. We don't get any orders along that line. We don't give anybody our code. But it is the ability to move fast in these markets, especially what we talked about on the Internet of Everything, to really have some guidelines that we can all live by and countries learn to trust each other and businesses are free to do this in a, a very open way. So your request to President Obama would be that he should cooperate with his fellow leaders. I think create from those every guidelines. government leader to work together on this would okay. be the request. Okay. Other guidelines? I mean, yeah, other I was, was going to say that the legislation and the regulation has to catch up. And uh, I mean, this is a, a challenge, I think, for the uh, many different parts of our, our business models at the moment. It's, it's often several years behind. And, uh, and, and certainly in this sphere, it, it's, it's not fit for purpose today. I think everybody recognizes the, uh, the internet plays a role in, in protecting us, uh, but we've got to make sure that it, uh, it's not intrusive uh, and it also pr protects the rights of the individual. And at the moment, I, d I don't think the legislation is, has, has managed to keep up with the way the technology is, has really brought us forward over the last few years. So your so request is for more laws in parliament to, to, yeah, to clarify this. Exactly, making yeah. it clear. I mean, it's to Mar Marissa's point is, it's just too murky at the moment. It needs to be transparent. Um, there needs to be clear guidelines of what's acceptable and what isn't acceptable. Okay, other comments? I think this is a very, number one is, this was a very healthy discussion that's happened over the last six months. It's way overdue. Um, number two, only through this concept of transparency will we get back to trust. But number three, it's gonna really drive customer choice. That is, we're getting to a customer-centric world, and the customer has to be able to choose exactly where they want their data and have, be able to m see it, monitor it, and manage it, and it cannot be anonymous like it is with some <laughs> providers. So I think that the most important thing, and I think our model is probably the closest to kind of where things need to move to, the customer chooses our service, they can choose what country they want it run out of, they can go into the data centers, they can audit it, they can go and look <coughs> at it, they can understand exactly what's happening, they can have it exactly as they want it, to the precision that they know that this is their data and this is where it is. 
It cannot be anonymous. It cannot be a anonymous world. That, and I think that too much of it, the way that it's been run up to this point, um, transparency is not just about the government, transparency is also about vendors. Vendors have to provide complete and total transparency themselves, okay? And they also can't pin it all on the government. It, it, and that will provide, you know, trust. Because the, ultimately the customer, whether it's a consumer or a business, wants to know everything, you know? And I think we're moving into a world of opt-in transparency. You know, go back to my first story with Fitbit, there's more information available to me than ever before on this Fitbit network. And it's gonna only increase over the next 10 so years. So are you saying, Mark, that this is gonna be a big dial at Salesforce where you can dial, you know, I don't care if the NSA can hack on the customer, hack me or I don't wanna be hacked? You say, uh, I, I don't think they, that that is, I don't think that's I, I the right way. To, I, I, think my, that's, I want all my Salesforce data in some other country. I, I think that that's kind of a sensa sensationalist look at it, <laughs> yeah. okay? Because you could just plug in you could change those words with a lot of different things that I won't use, but I think that it's more about the customer needs to be able to sit, choose so that they have complete comfort with how it's being handled. So they could choose, they could pu push the dial all the way in one direction if they wanted to. They can right? do exactly what they want. So that's they what you want to be able, That's what you want to be able to provide. That's what Is we that, are. We provide that, and it, and we'll provide that in spades going forward. But I think ultimately the customer has to have total transparency. And I think, you know, one example is if a consumer is using a consumer mail service, okay, you may not know where is your mail. I think you have to know. Yeah. I think you have to know what country and what laws is, are governing your data. And I think that the Germans actually have, a, have it right in a lot of cases where they look at, look, this is your data. You need to own it. For our customers, we already know that. It's not our data. It's our customers. Mm -hmm. we, don't, can't see, we can't see our customers' data, nor do we want to. You know, I think every company who's on the stage here is a, one of our customers. We don't want to see their data. We only want to help them manage it in a lower cost, more efficient way and give them choice of exactly how they want it. And I think that that is what, bring that back to the consumer as well, not just the business. Okay. See, I, I, I want to just respond because Mark is hitting on something that to me is foundational for all of this. And, and that is we've all been up here and, and when we talk, we start leaning forward and, and we get really excited because of what all of this, the hope that all this brings, not just to our businesses, but to society and, yeah. and what this connected world means. And you talked about the economic growth multipliers from all of this. And I would suggest, okay. the customers don't have a high, high degree of confidence that the data that is traversing these devices, these networks and so forth, is secure and that you're controlling to determining the, the origin and the, and the use of that data. And so, uh, President Obama made a speech Friday. Uh, since I've been here in Europe, some people have said they found it unfulfilling and didn't go far enough. The debate has begun, all right? And I think it is really good that the debate has begun. You know, we came out of 9-11, you know, in 2001 and, and the pendulum really swung towards security and now people are saying, wait, security versus privacy, you know, there's a balance here. And I think at the end of the day, the customer needs to be able to have a lot of say and where that pendulum sits. We're for at the beginning reasons. of a very important discussion that is not going to end. That's exactly right. And that's, yes. that's very important. But ultimately you have to remember this data is yours and you have rights associated with that data and, and um, you know, for, you know, like I said, for our model, we obviously get that. <laughs> but I think in the consumer world, that model needs to take hold. So uh, I think I know the answer to this question, but in the future, how much privacy do you think users of technology can expect to, to have? How much can they? I think the users need to dictate it themselves. Could it be 100% exactly. privacy? I think that's unlikely, personally. Why? Because I think that means zero security, and uh, I'm not sure in the Na debate. National security. Yeah, national security. And I, th I think when it comes down to it, um, I think uh, people recognize that uh, um, they have to give up some of their privacy in order to, um, to be protected. Um, I think yeah. you can give So I, I don't think it'll ever be zero. I think you can give user choice though. Certainly we believe that our users own the data and they should have a lot of rights. That said, when you look at various governmental programs, usually when you're making a trade off with privacy, it's very clear what's being looked for and how the information's being used. When you go through security at the airport, 
when you sign up for a driver's license, you know exactly what you're disclosing to the government and you know what you get in exchange. And I think that what's murky about uh, some of what's happening today is people don't necessarily know what information is being collected and how it's being used. And that's the transparency that we're really asking for and, and trying to awaken a debate on. But even if, if everybody saw the detail, they would probably be completely comfortable. Yeah. But I think that because we don't know what the detail is, that's what causes the concern. How can you trust something you don't know? It's the un Nobody likes the unknown. So that's why it needs to get opened up. Yep. But so. I think you're, you're on government issues. This yep. is going to apply to bad guys. It's going to apply to rogue nation states. It's, it's going to apply to terrorists, et cetera. And after the internet of everything, which is going to be explosive growth for everyone in this room, security will be the fastest growing segment. We spent $3 billion the other day buying a security company. It is the ability to give the user the confidence where you can come as close to 100% confidentiality if that's what you want and you manage it yourself, which is where it should be done. Now, then you'll have consumer choice on what you want to share with friends and others. So this is where you've got to think about it from architectures, and you've got to think about it in total, as opposed to just one element of security. But it, it will change the industry. Networks will be self-learning on this. You'll see security everywhere in terms of privacy and the capability to enforce it. But to come back to my question, can, can anyone expect 100% privacy in the future? No. Gavin, you said no. Right? Of course not. There'll be transparency, but not 100% pri privacy. Yeah. yeah. John? No? I'd say it's going to be much higher than people think. I'd put it at 90% okay. plus. I think it has to be. Now, the consumer can decide exactly what choice they want. They'll die. My, my, my kids will share everything. Right. Uh, as they get older, they'll probably cut back on that. But the highest amount of pri <laughs> <laughs> the highest amount of privacy is probably 90%. Is that a, the number we're agreeing? You're making a face mark. Does like, it, does what is it today? Want 100 percent mm -hmm. privacy? I mean, for, for, mm -hmm. for example, law enforcement. I mean, there are serious law enforcement implications to saying you want 100% privacy. Right. That means if somebody is being shot at and, and you have their mobile phone and you can triangulate where they are, that means law enforcement knows where you are. They know something about you. That's not 100% privacy. All right? mm -hmm. So I don't think we as a society want 100% privacy, but I think mm -hmm. the debate is right. Where should the pendulum be and where should the dial be? Okay. Let's take a question from the audience. One back here. Hi, I'm uh, Naveen Manon from AT Kani. Um, I have a question because I, I, I see that we live in this world of extremities and what you've talked about is primarily developed market situations and issues. I cover APAC and we see smartphone penetrations of around 20% or less. We see bandwidth in the, in the region of 2 Mbps, if you're lucky. Uh, we don't see a local app development market at all uh, in, 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 in a local in-country context. <clears throat> but on the other hand, you know, how far is too far? And we talk about, you talked about one trillion connected uh, sensors. Uh, you know, we talked about connect connecting your toothbrush uh, and speaking to a Philips uh, agent while you're brushing your teeth in the morning. So my question on the first hand, on, on one hand is, what more can we do? basically, for developing countries, because clearly what we're doing is not enough. And on the other hand, you know, where, does, where, is, how, where have we gone too far? Uh, can you envisage a scenario where we've taken connectivity too far? I'll take a crack sure. at it. Um, you know, in the emerging markets, there are two equalizers of life. First is education, second was the internet. Now it's the internet of everything. Almost every government leader I talk to, and I talk to them all in the emerging markets, the BRICS, the next 15, understand this technology can change their whole country, and they aren't going to follow the developed world. In fact, many emerging markets will skip a generation or two. Watch what China's doing on healthcare, Sichuan province. They already take people that have never seen a doctor and connect it with the best doctors, video conferencing-wise, into the given <laughs> cities, et cetera, on it. You see this understood in India. You see it clearly understood in Brazil. You see it clearly understood in Russia. I actually think emerging countries will use this as a chance not to catch up, but to skip a generation. I get pretty optimistic. But that's where you've got to have service providers working with government, with business, to really skip that generation. But I'm much more optimistic than you are about how quickly emerging countries will move here. And competition will not be between countries. It will be more between cities, which has a whole separate implication. Another question? Yeah, over here. Um, my name is uh, Peter Nota. I lead the um, Global Consumer Division at Philips. Uh, Mark, I make your uh, Philips Sonicare <laughs> toothbrush, so uh, thank you for... I'm here to help out. What can I say? <laughs> thank you for, 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 for life, though. 
So it's, it's a great example of, of how uh, connected uh, devices uh, can really also empower people to take care of their own health. So um, I think one of the areas that wasn't talked about uh, at, at great lengths today yet is that also the digital contact can really revolutionize uh, the healthcare. Uh, and of course, give more people access uh, to healthcare. Can maybe a few of the panelists uh, talk how uh, you see that? Well, I think one thing is, um, first of all, to come back to your point, you know, the, 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 this revolution, the costs are just coming down dramatically. And so your region is going to benefit, and I think more, far more than the developed world, especially in regards to education, number one and uh, communication, just broad enlightenment for individuals who are going to be able to have one of these devices. They're going to be able to have knowledge of the world that has been kind of locked up in developing countries, and that's happening now, and it's going to just be a, a tidal wave. Number two, um, I think healthcare is probably one of the most exciting areas of transformation that we will see, and I think this is a great you know example. The very first sensor I ever wo wore was the Philips Direct Life product. And I probably have one of every single one of these things. <laughs> but the next generation of these devices, as I was kind of alluding to, when you, you know, the, the thing that's amazing about healthcare is, you know, we go to the doctor maybe once a year, maybe twice a year to get our labs done, look at our biomarkers, you know, our cholesterol level, maybe if we're eating fish now in the ocean, we're checking our mercury level, which is super important because mercury is on the rise in the ocean because of the huge amount of coal that this planet is burning, especially in, in uh, emerging economies. And, you know, so we're getting these biomarkers done, you know, once a year and maybe get our <coughs> blood pressure taken, getting our heart rate checked. Really, that's not what you want. What you really want is to see it over a period of time, you know? Let's see how Mark is doing under stress up here on the panel. I'm sure my biomarkers right now look very different, you know, <laughs> than when I'm in my doctor's office all kind of chilled out. And that is gonna be dramatic, but that's not the most exciting thing. It's not just connecting the patient in a more detailed, more, more dynamic way. It's also the ability to connect to the doctors. You know, that the doctors are, number one, gonna be able to share and collaborate much more intelligently with, the, with each other, and the patients are going to be able to collaborate with their doctor now. On a regular basis, I will send my doctor information coming off my smartphone based on devices that I have on me, and I think that's re really, really exciting. So I, I think that this is going to be dramatically changing. Now, to that point, we'll kind of get back to the economic side. I was with a, the president of a large insurance cus customer of ours in France uh, yesterday, and Look, they're going to give me a discount if they can if I'm going to opt in to their networks because they're going to know. Oh, okay, you know that all these numbers are going in the right direction. Or if I'm a car manufacturer and I'm building the new smart car, uh, working with Toyota on a, com a car concept called Toyota Friend. Like if I have 5,000 friends on Facebook, why is my car not my friend? A collaborative car, a car that can talk to Toyota, the dealer, other drivers, to the driver themselves through the smartphone, but the cool thing about the smart car is also I want the insurance company to know I'm a safe driver. I drive in the speed limit, here's what I'm doing, but I'm gonna opt in certain information. I wanna know obviously everything that I'm opting in. Uh, that, that concept that I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a more dynamic relationship with those core providers, it's gonna, it's gonna dramatically change you know, my, my lifestyle, it's, it's awesome. And healthcare is the best example. John, do you have a comment? Yeah, I, I think we're missing the point on the healthcare discussion. Uh, healthcare has been the only industry in the world that has negative productivity for the last 20 years. And merely- Edu Education. Education's close. And uh, <laughs> if you watch, if all you're doing is dealing with healthcare in silos, you're not gonna accomplish the goal. It's about getting the right information to the right device at the right time to the right person who can make the right decision, which means you've got to change the healthcare process to get the productivity. The mayor of Barcelona is here. He's the example of the first truly smart city in the world. 
He'll tell you doing street lighting separate from crime, separate from traffic control, separate from health care, separate from garbage disposal, et cetera, doesn't get the job done. It's when you integrate them together and you change the whole process behind it is where the leverage occurs. So as we think about what these technologies can do, and using healthcare as a prime example, you can't think in silos. You've got to go across those silos and change the paradigm and the process that goes with it. Otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of money and you're going to be very disappointed in the results as, as many countries around the world have already been. And it's going to go all the way down to, and this is a metaphor for everything then, in healthcare precision medicine, you know, where you're going to get the right drug for your genome, for your, you know, microbiome, for, you know, for you, you know, and um, th this is amazing what's happening. I mean, the, the, the generation of this data will have broad implications on our ability to be just much, much healthier, but also to be able to, to, to treat ourselves and to know exactly, you know, what, what's happening and how to do that. We have, we've talked about wearables. We haven't talked about ingestibles, which are little computers. Or implantables, that, yeah. You know, yeah. We're going to be swallowing these little computers and... They're going to be reading out on our smartphone. Well, here's your current bacteria count in, in your gut. And, you know, and then you're going to be like, well, that doesn't seem exactly right. Maybe you're checking with my gastroenterologist on that. And maybe I need to be changing my probiotic formula and change my microbiome. Phenomenal studies this year on how you're changing your microbiome can dramatically improve your health. But we don't know how, and it's going to require that level of precision medicine. We're, all these things are coming together in this really interesting way. To, it's really to John, fascinating. To, John, to John's point, I just wanted to emphasize one thing, and Mark is nailing it, but I, I would suggest there are three areas that have escaped the productivity miracle in the last 30 years. Healthcare, which you know, you've heard talked extensively up here. Government services, which have, <laughs> no surprise. And education has escaped the productivity miracle the last 30 years. And this technology and everything we're talking about, I think, can do as much on education as what you're hearing discussed on healthcare. And I, I can just give one really small example of where you're seeing this play out. We at AT&T are competing for computer science capability and specialists, and getting the numbers we need is really, really hard. So we partnered with Georgia Tech. And Georgia Tech, if you want a master's of computer science degree accredited by the state of Georgia, top five engineering school, $40,000 to get that at Georgia Tech. We launched and started this January a master's of computer science degree fully accredited from the state of Georgia from Georgia Tech for $6,700. And we don't think we're scratching the surface here. Okay. And the numbers that we're going to be able to generate out of this are what's really impressive. Not that just the cost is coming down, the productivity, you're going to see that materialize. But the numbers that we can actually put through a Georgia Tech Master Computer Science <laughs> program is really, really impressive. So I just think a lot of industries that have escaped productivity are not going to escape the next five years. Um, Randall, so, how are you doing that? We, we only, how are, can you, um, using technology, uh, in, in this particular example, we're partnering with Udacity. And so Sebastian Thrun, all you guys know Sebastian. We're working with him to deliver the technology and a lot of the devices that you're seeing right here and developing curriculum that is rendered and curated for that delivery mechanism. And so it's, it's really exciting. And uh, we have high, high expectations for this. The first class we kept pared down and uh, they haven't given numbers yet, but the applications, the qualified applications of people to this program was stunning. The numbers of qualified applications we got. And I have told Georgia Tech, I will fund every AT&T person that qualifies to go through there. Anybody that wants an AT&T will pay for it and send them through. We've had a great panel. We only have five minutes left. I'm going to ask the panelists to do something impossible. <clears throat> I'm going to give each of you one minute <laughs> to describe uh, what will be important in the next five years and how everyone in this audience can thrive in that world. One minute. Go ahead, Gavin. Um, I, th I think it's big data. I think the processing power that uh, uh, is now available through big, big data um, will transform the way we do business, uh, we live our lives, how we're governed. Uh, and uh, so if there's one thing to become proficient at uh, is understanding how big data can, uh, can really change and whatever you're doing with And your BT, you're driving this, this effort. Well, it's one thing, Will. I think it's, it's much bigger than BT, obviously, but yeah. uh, it is an area we're focused on, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mark. Um, you know what, my, 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 my um, prescription to our customers is that they have to connect with their customers in a new way. 
I think that the most important thing that people in this room who are kind of decision makers and leaders of organizations can do is just recognize that as we talk about these devices and these phones, these tweets and these posts and these networks, that you never forget for a second that behind every single one of them is a customer, that it's not an internet of things, it's not an internet of everything, it's an internet of people, an internet of customers, of human beings, and this is a phenomenal opportunity to connect with them on a much deeper basis. We've talked a lot about B2C. Some companies would say we're B2C companies. It's kind of code word for we don't know who our customers actually are. We have to do focus groups because to break through the anonymity of our customers, that's gonna completely go away. We're gonna be moving to this one-to-one -one relationship with them and it's a phenomenal time. And the companies who get there the fastest, who have that deep one-to-one -one relationship with each and every customer, whether you're a B2C or B2B company, are companies that are going to be the fast growers of the future. So for sure we say we're entering the age of the customer, and that's not overstated. Yep. Marissa, sir. I, I think the word that's top of mind for me is context. And we've talked about it in a lot of different ways, between big data, the Internet of Things, knowing your customer, all these different pieces. But what's really happening is through all these advances, we're we're assembling unprecedented amounts of context for each individual. And when you look at the types of efficiency that you can gain from that, right, either because you're being more efficient in how you use your car, your home, or even just in terms of how you conduct your daily life. When you look at these services, you know, for example, you know, are you standing outside of a restaurant? As a result, like you might need a reservation at another restaurant. Are you somewhere in the developing world and you're 100 miles away from the nearest doctor and you need a video conference to actually have a consultation? And when you actually bring all those elements of context Air, the way it's going to change everyone's daily habits and what they do each day and how they approach it is really fundamental. And I would say that to, your, to the question of privacy, people certainly need to be informed of it. They need to understand how that context is, is processed and how it's being used. But I would, I would encourage everyone to think about you know, how much information are you comfortable sharing? Because I think that sharing it with the right, with the right vendors and in the right way can actually be incredibly life-changing and obviously for the better. Can you do it in 30 seconds? We're running out of time. <laughs> okay. I think it's going to be the time when everything comes together. The Internet of Everything, cloud, mobility, process change. And it's going to be a combination of these changes that really change our lives uniquely. It won't be siloed anymore. And that's why I think 2014 will be the tipping point for how IT changes the world. Okay. Last five years were really impressive in terms of how it changed. Gavin and my industries, cloud hyper fast mobile networks, virtualization, big data. There is not an industry that will not be radically impacted over the next five years. Not one will be radically unimpacted over the next five years. Okay. So just to sum up very quickly uh, from our panel, it's been fantastic, by the way. So number one, Mark is clean and fit. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, George. <laughs> and apparently he's a big shareholder in Phillips. Uh, <laughs> Uh, personal tech, uh, very critical. Uh, Mark talked about it extensively. It's big technology, bandwidth, Internet of Things, apps. President Obama, please give more transparency to the tech vendors, but also to, uh, to, the, to the citizens to, and all leaders. Uh, all leaders should be giving more transparency. Uh, Prime Minister Cameron, better legislation in the parliament to clarify these issues. And expecting 90% privacy in the future as a maximum. And so I want to thank our panel, fantastic Randall, John, well Marissa, Mark, Gavin. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.